It's a type of photography I think every photographer at one point or another has tried or at least thought about. Today, we discuss water droplet refraction with Don Komarechka on this episode of Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Shot, the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all those stories and challenges that happen in between. And it's an opportunity for you to look at photography that's not just your style, but all styles find the commonalities and learn something from everybody's type of shot. I'm Steve Brazel, your host, as always. Thanks for joining me. Before I get into today's guest, which I'm actually excited about because today's guest is somebody who's making his third appearance on the show, and I really mean it. It's a type of photography we've all either thought about or tried at some point in time, but I would like to ask you once again, please make sure that you head by iTunes, whatever country you might be in, drop us not only a star rating, but also a text review. It does help with discovery and it's much appreciated as well. So let's get into today's guest. I wanna get into this kind of quickly. Today's guest is making his third appearance on the show and is one of my favorite guests to have on for a number of reasons. A, his photography is insane. B, he's actually the most successful show I've ever had, the one that we did with the Sweat Bee, over 12,000 views, 11,000 something, or about 12,000 views on YouTube alone. I want to welcome Don Komarechka to the show. Don, how are you, buddy? I am great, Steve. Thank you so much for having me back on. We've talked uh, about making this happen periodically since that last Sweat Bee episode, and I'm glad it's kindly, uh, finally come to fruition. Yeah, I... And, and again, that episode, <clears throat> I go check it periodically and out of nowhere, it'll suddenly have a thousand more views. And it's because you're the type of photographer that is out there. People read articles in magazines about you. They see other podcasts with you, your own podcast. They read um, reviews of your work or of your book or something. And when they do, they end up either Googling you or it comes up in a video of, hey, the next video about Don Komarechka is this. And that YouTube video is done really, really well because people love your work. So let's let's talk about you a little bit. And by the way, if people want to see the Sweat Bee episode uh, or the first episode you were on, the first episode we did snowflake photography and the second one was the Sweat Bee. If they want to see those, they will be listed with links in the show notes at BehindTheShot.tv. So just head up there. You can see a small gallery of Don's work. You can find the other episodes, all of that type of stuff. So. You describe yourself as what kind of photographer? Because you do a lot of different things. Yeah, you know, I like infrared and ultraviolet, macro on any scale. Uh, I, I love astrophotography, revealing views of the world that we can't see with our own eyes. So that unseen world uh, sort of aspect of photography, uh, photography becomes a tool for me to explore, right? It's, yes, I get a, a fun image. Usually it's artistic, uh, as you see, as the image that we're going to discuss. Um, but it's based in an exploration of science. It's, it's based in a way that I can perceive the world beyond my own perception. And photography for me then becomes sort of an extension of the way that I can see the world. And a lot of the stuff that I end up doing is stepping stones towards a successful image. Uh, the image we're talking about today was a uh, studio setup that took more than four hours of just tinkering before I discovered what I wanted to even create. Remind uh, me of that when we get to the shot, because four hours surprises me. Well, because you don't know what you're going to create at the end of it. Uh, if I knew exactly what the final shot was going to be, it might take me 15 minutes to get there. But I don't know what I'm going to create. I just try different things. And from one step to another, you just one idea, success or failure branches off to five new ones. And you explore those. Some are successful and some are not. And you kind of... Uh, it's it's like a game of Plinko. You know, every new step, the puck will go one way or the other. Uh, and then from the next one, it'll go one way or another. And every one of those steps is an experiment. It's a, oh, what if I try this differently? I, and I know exactly what you mean. And so I, I have it, Plinko experience. Oh, good, good. It, it, it takes time, um, but it's it's useful time for me. It's therapeutic. I love the problem solving aspect to figure out what that next step is going to be, even if it doesn't result in a successful image. And I, honestly, I think that's what a lot of photographers are missing. They're always after the goal rather than the process. And I think you can say that about life in general. Yeah, and and I think that actually, you know what? That I, I'm glad somebody finally said that because I think it's one of the things that we we as creatives, we know, 
but we fight. And in some ways, it's not something that you should fight. We all fight for the perfect image. We're all afraid of spending time on an image and having it, I don't want to use the word fail, it's the wrong word, having it not meet our goals or expectations. But in reality, uh, as we say in martial arts at times, there, there's times you win and there's times you learn, right? That's exactly. really what it comes down to. Now, I describe you to people as mostly, to me, a macro photographer <clears throat> with the snowflakes and kind of the stuff we're doing today, uh, insects, the, the, the sweat bee episode, but also nature. You do, you have amazing landscape photography. You've got aerial photography. You kind of shoot a little bit of everything. You're based in Canada and your shots. If people go look at your websites, which I'm putting up underneath us, but we'll, we'll say also, uh, what's your main website for you? So doncom.ca, D-O-N-K-O-M.ca. That's where you'll find a portfolio of my work and links to pretty much every place you can find me online. Um, the most updated stuff you'll find on my social media accounts like Facebook and Flickr and Instagram. And all of the links are there at the bottom of, the, of that website where I make every attempt to interact with every single comment or question that people provide. So if you want to get in touch with me personally, that's how you do it. And you've also got skycrystals.ca, which is the snowflake one. And that's the thing. When people look at your portfolio, they'll see uh, aurora pictures, aurora borealis. They'll see pollen, insects, infrared, uh, snowflakes, all kinds of things. And in fact, I, I'm trying to point to it correctly behind me here. This poster that's on the wall behind me is Don's poster that was a gift from him. So again, thank you for that. I make sure that it's in every single episode. You wrote a book on your snowflakes, sky crystals unraveling the mystery of snowflakes that people should look at. You're an educator, you do workshops, but you do workshops on different things. What 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 do your workshops encompass? I mean, it could be anything. You mentioned auroras, and I've got a um, a workshop in Iceland coming up in October, late October of this year, 2019. And that's going to be a thrill of an adventure beyond the travel season for most tourists and darker skies for those northern lights. But uh, I do a lot of stuff right here at home. We've got award-winning gardens in my backyard. And um, and I had a, uh, a sold-out workshop that somebody just dropped out of, and there's a new spot on that too, uh, where you can play around in those gardens with me guiding you through all of the compositional tips and studio work, doing water droplet refraction photography, which is a really fun three-hour workshop uh, that leads into kind of the the image that we're going to be talking about today, because that's the topic of discussion for and, this episode. And, and that one, actually, I would love to do because, again, I think every photographer at one point or another has tried to do or thought about doing, a, a, and I know I have uh, and failed, uh, a water droplet refraction image. It's not as easy as people think to get them to the quality of what we're about to see. Your images have been seen in museums, on coins, uh, on television, Discovery, BBC, Nat Geo. And with this photography background, you are also the most geeky photographer that I know at a level that many people can't keep up with. And yet everybody seems to really enjoy the, the geek conversation because let's face it, it ph photography done correctly can be technical. What's your podcast? Well, I, I, I want to interject people? for a second, Steve, though, because photography done correctly, and this is my opinion, it, it okay. varies based on subject matter, um, but photography is a weave of science and art. And so on the science side, and I might have said this on a previous episode, on the science side, you have all the technical stuff, figuring out all the settings in your camera, the right. physics of light. You know, in the past, it was the chemistry uh, and, and everything else. So you've got the science element. But you have the art side of it as well, lines and shapes and colors, right. stories and narratives, and what uh, the human perception of beauty is, which is something of an ethereal thing that's always you know, trying to catch smoke. You can't really define it, but you, you know it when you see it. Uh, and, and so photography takes both of those things and it connects them together. And the deeper you weave those two together, the more beautiful it's going to be. I completely agree, which is that podcast of yours. So what... What's the podcast? Where can people find it? So Photo Geek Weekly is the podcast, and you can get that at simply photogeekweekly.com or type that into iTunes or whatever uh, podcast app that you use, and you'll find it. We're the only ones with that name. So uh, we, uh, it's usually about an hour long or so on average, cover three to four news stories, the geekiest stuff that I can find on the internet from the news cycle of that week. Uh, and uh, it's me and a guest. And Steve, you are the the, the most prominent guest that is on my podcast because you can geek out like the best of them. I love uh, it. 
<laughs> and, and the stories are just fun because there's a lot of what if, there's a lot of cutting edge and riding that wave of technology forward, uh, I think is what every photographer should be doing in some degree. I mean, not to go out and buy every new gadget, mind you, right. but to be aware of where the industry is going. Because if you are not up to date with the latest tech and the latest opinions on that technology, then you might be losing work, losing clients, or you might not be adapting to the changing industry as well as you should. So uh, we have a lot of fun. And uh, you know what? I, I, even if nobody listened to it, I would still love to have that conversation on a weekly basis. It's well, just see, in my that's blood the thing to, to me that. is, and people do listen to it, but to me, it's the conversation uh, about cutting edge uh, technologies being used around, it's not always photography literal, but around the world of photography. And the reason that I like it is because of, uh, eventually all of that trickles down to consumer. Anything that ends up being released to professionals or something like that usually will trickle down to consumer and it helps you to understand where you're going and it makes adopting it when it comes to your level of photography easier if you can if you can kind of see that and that brings us to this shot because the shot that we're going to talk about today really to me and when you see the I've got some behind the scenes that Don sent me when you see the setup of this shot you'll understand so this is water droplet refraction many of people don't many people out there don't know that technical term they think oh putting a flower behind bubbles, you know, or water drops. It's water droplet refraction. What's the name of this shot? So this shot I called Essence of Reverie. And uh, that, that means something to me because reverie is like a, a daydream, something um, ethereal, just some fancy thought while your mind wanders when it shouldn't uh, necessarily be wandering. And it creates uh, sort of a fantasy in front of you of, of maybe what your hopes and desires are. You know, that, that, that's what reverie is to me. And this shot kind of is the essence of that because it's the essence of my tinkering and that what if and that question, but it also has kind of a magical feel to it as well. And lately I've had a lot of people moving and listening when they're driving. I just had somebody mention the other day that they were driving and decided to listen while they were driving to three episodes in the audio feed. So they can't see the picture. So I always recommend go to the website, find the associated blog post at behindtheshot.tv for this episode. You can see the photo there, but I'm also going to try and describe it to you. And even though I'm technically hey, good not luck right. with this one, Steve. <laughs> say, say again? Good luck describing this one to somebody listening only in the audio podcast. I know, it's not going to be easy, but, and, and you're going to want to correct me, but I, I understand that this is not a twig, but I'm going to describe it that way because that's what I thought it was when I first saw it, and I think it'll bring the image to people. So I want you to picture a small Christmas tree. When I say small, I mean two inches, like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree, right? Like a small twig with a couple of needles sticking out that goes up and at the very top flops over. And all over that little teeny micro tree or twig are water droplets. And behind the water droplets, very, very blurry, you can barely tell what it is, is a flower. And the flower is being magnified. It's not just a reflection, but it's being magnified by those water droplets where you can perfectly see the flower inside the water droplets. Now, Underneath it, it also reflects into some water. And, and the reason I describe it that way and, and preface it by saying I know I'm incorrect is, and we'll get into it in a minute, this is not a twig. It's something much smaller than a twig. So let's go with the technical end first. What camera body and lens combination did you use for this shot? So this was shot with an overkill camera for this kind of thing. This was shot with the Canon 1DX, uh, which, I mean, it's the camera that I had at the time. So it's the camera that I was shooting everything with, regardless of if it needed uh, ridiculously fine-tuned autofocus uh, and what have you. This was shot in 2014. And uh, so it was the, just the camera that I had in hand. Uh, you could do this with any camera. I've okay. done shots of water droplet refractions with uh, the, the Lumix GX9, a fairly small compact micro four thirds camera. Uh, so the, uh, the, the camera body itself is, is not necessarily material. Uh, the lens, however, is uh, my go-to uh, lens for uh, higher magnification macro photography. It's the lens that I use for all of my snowflake work. Uh, and uh, it is the Canon MPE. 
E 65 millimeter uh, f 2.8 1x to 5x macro lens. And that's important that I mention that 1x to 5x because the average macro lens will only get to one to one magnification. That is the definition of macro, right? right? Okay. Macro means life size. And so one to one means that the object in reality appears th that exact same size on your camera sensor. Um, and I like, uh, I, I liken this to if I were to photograph, uh, you know, a penny or a dime or some small coin on film at one to one magnification and then take that frame of film and then take that coin and overlap them and they fit perfectly. Right, because okay. it's gotcha. the same size uh, projected onto the sensor or film as it would be in reality, and that is macro photography in a very narrow definition. Um, in this case, this lens actually gets beyond that. It starts at that one to one and gets to five to one magnification, five times closer than the average macro lens gets, and that gives me a lot of flexibility. And that, for it's very it's small not subjects. one or the other. It's not one or five. You can adjust it anywhere in between. It has a ring that lets you just smoothly adjust anywhere between them. It has no focusing ring. It has no autofocus whatsoever or manual focus for that matter. It has no zoom. It's a prime. The only ring that it has for adjustment is magnification. So how do you, uh, oh, you focus by moving the camera in and you out? You physically move the entire camera and lens forward and backward. Okay. Uh, now, a lot of people have done that traditionally on a tripod using uh, an apparatus known as a focusing rail, which right. lets you do that in a fairly linear uh, motion. Um, however, for a certain shots, especially like this, where the alignment of ingredients is very important. I have to rotate the camera around the water droplets being the center point of rotation. If you're on a tripod, the center point of rotation is wherever the tripod mount is, right? Uh, and that's clearly not feasible here, and there's no gimbal setup that would work in this kind of a scenario. So this is shot handheld, um, as I do with a lot of my macro work, because you have to work- this handheld? Better. This is handheld, um, and you have to work very quickly to adjust for certain variables because um, those droplets, you can see some very, very small droplets am amongst the bigger ones. Right. They're actively evaporating. I mean, if I were to take five minutes to take the, the photograph, once I have everything set up, all of those small droplets are gone. You can't take those minutes because that will destroy the shot. You have to work as quickly as possible uh, in order to maintain the shot as you want it to be. At a high magnification. What was the magnification on this one? So I, I pulled that up because that lens does record in the uh, in the maker notes area of metadata. I had to re-reference the raw file and run that through a tool called uh, EXIF tool uh, to pull that up because Adobe, uh, in their infinite wisdom, strips that information out of any processed file. And I'm yet not going to go down surprised. that road right now. Um, but I pulled it up and it is a 1.5 times magnification. And, and that's important because that's not so extreme. That's if you were to put extension tubes on a macro lens on a full frame camera, you're right there. If you were at one to one on a micro four thirds camera, you're at, you actually have an effective magnification greater than this. So it's a very approachable kind of shot in order to take in terms of the equipment being used. There's lots of things to, to, to get there, to get this kind of framing. So, as you're looking at, let, let, let's go a little bit generic here for a minute, right? When you're talking in general about, you know, macro photography, water droplet photography specifically, give me kind of the short overview, the helicopter view. What is your goal when you're shooting water droplet refractions? What are you trying to capture in a shot like this, in a perfect so for, shot like this? Well, for, first thing you need is a, a spherical water droplet. The more spherical it is, the more it can act like a lens. Um, and so if you just put a drop of water on a blade of grass or a leaf, it might just kind of smooth out like a, like a sheet. Right, they flatten out. It, they might flatten out. Uh, some surfaces don't do that. Uh, a lot of bl bluegrasses will have a powder coating. Uh, eucalyptus has the same thing that will keep a spherical droplet. Spider webs are much the same. But every wildflower seed has a, um, a sail, like a dandelion seed, you know, the fluff of a dandelion seed. Yep. That will make a, uh, a spherical water droplet when that water droplet appears on the little tiny strands of that seed itself. Um, as same is true for, uh, I don't know, milkweed or uh, any, anything. Wildflower seeds are the go-to thing to create this type of stuff. So, um, Which is, by the way, why I said earlier it's not really a twig because this is a wildflower seed. 
It is. Prairie smoke is the wildflower here. Uh, and so prairie smoke has these long, uh, bendy, twisty uh, kind of spines that have all of these little hairs running off of it. I call them right. hairs. I don't know what the actual term is. Um, and all of those little hairs, those little fibers, uh, when you spray it with just a dollar store spray bottle, uh, will create this wonderful array of water droplets. It, it, now, are you trick- using just normal tap water? Or does it have to normal be distilled water. water? Nothing special. A lot of people ask me every time I do a workshop on this, you know, do I add anything to the water like glycerin? And the answer is no. Glycerin, uh, you might find in tutorials when you look this kind of stuff up online, will make a water droplet stick in place instead of rolling off of its surface. Um, but it does nothing to the the cohesiveness of the, the spherical design. Uh, and I've always found with the subjects that I work with, plain old tap water works just fine. I did try glycerin once or twice just to see if it works. And it does. But see, I, I usually have a second uh, a second purpose to this photography. I'll buy a bouquet of flowers or a nice potted bunch of flowers, and I get to take my flowers for my photography purposes. Once that's done, it becomes a gift for my wife, right? Dual purpose, wonderful, everybody's happy. Well, when you spray, uh, spray glycerin water on flowers and whatever, when it dries, it looks a lot like snail slime does not make an attractive gift to my better half. It's not so, a pretty picture in my head either, actually, yeah. Yeah, so, so the glycerin I, I don't use, and, and this shot does not include it. 99% of my water droplet images are just plain old tap water. So looking at this image, right, you can see the flower behind it, and I'm going to show some behind-the-scenes images here in just a second. But before I do that, is there an optimum distance based on, like, this is a seed, but let's say you were using something bigger or smaller as the subject to hold the water droplets. Is there a... A, an optimal distance for that background item that you want reflected, in this case, a flower, but it could also be wallpaper with a pattern on it. I mean, it can be anything. It could be anything. Is there the, a distance you aim for between the water droplets and that background? It varies on three factors. Number one, the size of the droplet. Number two, the size of the object behind. And number three, the focal length of the lens. So there's no optimal That doesn't sound distance. then like something you can calculate. You just have to play. Oh, you could calculate it. I just don't spend my time doing that okay. because it's so much easier to uh, just... If you're looking through the viewfinder of your camera at those higher magnifications, and you can even see it just with your own eyes to some degree, not necessarily fine-tuning it, But if you only see the center of the flower and not the petals or anything, it's too close. If you see a lot of stuff beyond the petals themselves in the background, it's too far. And so you just move it back and forth based on what you see and perceive. In this case, we're using, uh, I think it's an osteospermum or some sort of African daisy uh, species of flower that I specifically bought from the garden store because I noticed it had a bluish color in the center. Now, these are smaller than the normal flowers that I use for this kind of photography. The, The average one would be a Gerbera daisy, much similar design, but larger. I've never seen a Gerbera daisy with a blue center, however, so I wanted to try this out. It's a smaller flower, so it's positioned much closer than it would be if I was using a larger one. Okay, and I'm going to bring up the behind the scenes here in a second, but before I do, I want to, uh, there's another question that, that hit me. Do, do the flower and the droplets need to be in relationship to the camera and lens on a specific plane or yes, is there, it just there, rotated until you see it in in the drops? There is a linear relationship. So there's kind of a line that everything has to fall through. And that's why I said that, that I typically shoot this handheld, because I don't know exactly a slight shift left or right is going to change that alignment considerably. Um, so the flower has to be um, directly, or I mean, it's your creative intent, but uh, the flower is where you're framing things on, on the outside of the edges of the frame. And then whatever the droplets are have to be within the frame where you choose them to be. And if I were to move the camera left or right, but keeping the camera focused on the seed, the background is going to move left or right. So yes, you have to have uh, everything all in a proper alignment. And that takes just a bit of practice. You're going to go through a number of trial and error attempts at this, just learning and getting that feedback of, okay, what works, what doesn't, how I'm going to put the shot together to suit your needs. And there's one thing in this image that that immediately leaped at me when I saw it. I don't know if it will to anybody else, but I'm I'm weird that way. The reflection. 
So the reflection under this seed in the water is nice and soft and blurry. Uh -huh. The water droplets in the reflection are tack sharp. Is that normal or is that a focus stack? How'd you do that? This image is about 15 shots focus stacked. Oh, and there's a few okay. reasons why I use that many images. And so for, uh, for somebody that might not be familiar with focus stacking, one frame out of camera will have a very, very shallow depth of field, especially when you're going to higher magnifications in macro photography. There wouldn't be enough in focus to get the entire seed, for example. But um, I chose to, to do this in a specific way. I could have shot this shot at f22 and had most of that seed and reflection in focus. I might have needed only maybe three or four shots to have that in focus. But you want a distinct separation between the foreground and the background. You want the, the water droplets to portray a version of the flower nice and crisp and sharp. But you want the actual flower in the background to be soft, not completely blurry, but not a distraction. If I were to shoot this at F22 or a very small aperture around there, then the flower in the background would be much more in focus and the entire shot would feel cluttered. So this was shot at F5.6, which is a, uh, a wider aperture than I would normally use for a shot like this. But because that background flower was so much closer because it was smaller, I opted to shoot wider, maintaining that out of focus background while providing me the depth that I needed in the foreground across, like I said, maybe a dozen shots plus a couple uh, in order to get everything as tack sharp as I could. Okay, I, I have to ask this question because I'm curious more than anything. You're shooting handheld. You're not on a focus rail. How do you figure you're, you're making 15 shots? How do you figure what points to focus for those 15 shots, knowing that when you get into Photoshop to stack these, you're not going to go, oops, I missed that bubble. I take 100 shots, maybe more. Uh, I use 15, but I have no, uh, no forward knowledge of if I've gotten every shot that I need or specifically how many I need for, uh, for an image like this. It might turn out that I needed 20. Maybe I needed 11. Right. Um, but, or, and if I took 11, maybe I needed 15 and I missed some stuff in between, or maybe I took 15 and I missed one of them because one of them doubled up or wasn't evenly spaced. So I drastically overshoot. And then I pick just the ones that I need to complete the shot, uh, you know, in, in Photoshop. And typically what will happen is I'm going to miss a shot because it's a mental game of just remembering which ones you've selected and which ones aren't needed. And then I bring them into Photoshop and there's a focus stacking process there using under the edit menu, there's auto align layers and then auto blend layers. And if I missed a, a shot in that sequence, I can kind of pick it out and identify that and use that as a map to go back into Lightroom and find whatever shots I may have missed. Got in that you. Sequence, okay. So, and then add those as picks and then redo the process. The one thing I, I also was interested in in post, or not even, let's not get into, get into post yet, but in EXIF data, white balance shows as auto white balance. Well, so there's you're shooting no auto and setting it in post. Exactly. Because uh, I mean, I could go for reality, but I mean, this is, there's no skin tones. There's no, uh, you know, uh, Pantone logo colors that I need to match perfectly. Um, the actual colors for a scene like this are somewhat immaterial. If in post I decided, you know what, that flower might look a little bit better if it was more purple or right. I can sway those colors any which way that I want uh, for artistic. Intent. I'm assuming though, you start with an eyedropper clicking on the white Lee, the, the white petals or something yep. to see what accurate looks like. Yeah. And of course I want the whites to be neutral. Uh, and so I'll, I'll adjust that, but maybe uh, based on the, the image, uh, slightly cooler works, you know, with, with my snowflake images, uh, they're ever so slightly towards the cool side rather than completely flat gray. So there's again, just some artistic interpreta uh, interpretation there. It's not one of the ingredients that I want to be juggling while I'm shooting. I'm, I'm shooting raw, I can fix that afterwards. And the post-processing workflow is lengthy enough that adding an extra 12 seconds to that to set the white balance properly is not a big deal. Okay, so let's talk about the background, or just at least I want to show the background. This is the behind the scenes shot. For those of you on audio, it's basically a large bowl with an alligator clip holding the seed at the edge of the bowl, a long alligator clip holding the flower right over the water, and 
everything's kind of mounted on just whatever you can find in the kitchen. It looks like it looks like an yep. upside down coffee cup with a weighted <laughs> clip on it, holding the flower. I love that. That's just awesome. Here's a closer one for you so that you can kind of see the relationship of the seed to the flower. And the reason I wanted to show you this is it really in the normal picture, it looks like a twig. And when I say twig, I mean, it looks like it has size, right? But from this behind the scenes, you can clearly see that this thing is minuscule in comparison to that flower. So using this picture in your head, now picture this finished picture, how big that seed looks and actually is only covering the center blue of the flower and a little bit of the petals is just really fascinating to me. Your, your lighting for this. So uh, lighting for this, I, I'm a glutton for punishment, I suppose. Um, this is shot with an off-camera flash. Uh, at the time, I One? did not have wire. It, it's, uh, yeah, off-camera flash. I didn't have wireless triggers. So this is with a shoe cord attached to the camera. Okay. And the lighting angle needs to be very specific because my first test shots had the light from the flash hitting a little bit underneath the surface of the water, a little bit too much. And what happened then is I got a massive specular highlight off of the alligator clamp that is holding the pedal in place oh. that was large enough to completely disrupt the reflection. And so uh, two things to fix that. Number one, I changed the angle of the camera to be a little bit lower. The, the closer the, uh, the focal plane can be to be uh, perpendicular to the surface of the water, the stronger the reflection is going to be. Uh, so if I was shooting like on a 45 degree angle, I'm not going to see any real reflection at all. But if I'm shooting at a 90 degree or like an 87 degree, I didn't measure this, uh, but a, a close to perpendicular angle, then that reflection becomes more prominent and, uh, and anything underneath the water uh, is, uh, is less obvious because of that. So while I'm shooting, and I know I've got the perfect setup here, uh, I have to take a test shot, look at the camera, uh, and uh, now that I'm using mirrorless cameras, I wouldn't have to take my eye away from the viewfinder. But at the time, of course, I did, and then uh, make an adjustment, and then take another look, and it's right. The second shot had the, uh, the, the clamp removed from the scene, and I just, you hold your breath, you hold the end of the lens with your left hand. And that's important because that helps with a lot of stability. And I can just tug with my index finger and my thumb on the end of the lens forward and back to do the focus stacking. The distance that I have to move is the thickness of the subject, which is, I don't know, an eighth of an inch. Um, I, I didn't measure it, but it's not, it's not anything massive. It, it just, I can push with my face against the back of the camera too, back and forth, just a little bit of movement as I'm rapid fire shooting. The lighting is coming from the, the right-hand side, and I'm hand-holding the flash as well. Because you I have this to... this hand held with one hand? Yeah. So I, in, instead of holding the end of the lens with my one hand, that hand is holding the flash. And I'm going police officer, gun, and flashlight style. So you've got your gun in one hand, and you're supporting the, 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 um, the camera uh, with your wrist or your forearm. And then I'm holding the flash with my uh, hand and moving my wrist to adjust the angle of, of the flash to hitting the subject. So, of course, I'm holding the camera here and the, uh, the end of the lens is resting on my the hand. forearm of the hand that's crossing your body and holding the flash. OK, folks, if you're listening to this on audio, you can see this. Go find the video on the website behind the shot.tv <laughs> and you'll be able to see it because when you first said you you were going to do it, you know, handheld, I was picturing you know, this, you know, with, I'm trying to get it in frame. So camera and then holding the, the flash with one hand like that. But the way that you're crossing them, flashlight gun style makes a lot more sense. It shows you had a flash compensation here of plus 333 in EXIF data. This was just a speed light, I assume. Yep, were just you, a Canon 580 EX2, I believe. Were you using any modifiers whatsoever to, to direct the light, shape the light? Good point. No. And it's important that I wasn't because you want this light to be harsh and forward facing because if it was modified to be diffused in any way, it's not going to be where I want it to be. It's going to hit the clamp and other stuff underneath the surface of the water, which I don't but, want. So I need it to be directional. But couldn't you flag the sides of it in such a way to help control it? Not not modify the light coming out of the flash, but flag to prevent it. Yeah, from if spilling? I had five hands, I might be able to do that. Well, my uh, friend, I've heard that you do. 
but uh, the the idea here is that uh, specifically for water droplet images, and, and not just this uh, example, but most of the work that I do, you want more light to hit the background than the foreground. It's a very key ingredient here, and that requires directional light. It requires it to be harsh in order for it to shoot past a foreground subject to the background. And the reason why is you want the background to be brighter than the foreground. You'll notice that the spine of the seed, you can see a little bit on the curve, has a bit of light on it. Um, it can a little bit of a brown color tone to it, but the heart of it is black. It's dark. Right. Um, if that it's very entire ambient thing, feeling, it doesn't feel like flash. It's very ambient. Right. But if that, if that center part of that seed was brighter, if it had a more direct light source on it, it would be a distraction in the image. And so you want the foreground to be darker than the background. And that makes the water droplets pop very, very vibrantly on top of that foreground subject. Well, and, and arguably it's the flower that's the subject. It just happens yeah. to be refracted in the water droplets, but that's really what you're trying to get. What's, what is interesting to me on this shot from a compositional point of view, I was looking at it and it meets you know, four almost of the rule of third corners. It also meets the golden spiral, otherwise known as the golden ratio. It's the perfect crop to set all of that up. It's clear you've mentioned that you use Photoshop for doing your focus stacking. So Photoshop is is your software of choice for a shot like this. What would you, aside from the focus stacking, what image adjustments or maybe in Lightroom that you would have done, would you have done to a shot like this? So some basic things, um, uh, nothing too complex, just boosting the shadows and recovering the highlights uh, in, uh, in Lightroom before I send it off to Photoshop when I'm still dealing with raw data where those adjustments make a lot more sense. I, I shot this image at ISO 200, so there's no real noise to speak of, uh, even if I'm boosting those shadows a little bit, so I don't touch that too much. Although images like this do survive noise quite nicely. So uh, if you do have to boost that up, uh, it's it's lines and shapes. It's not like fine details and textures for the most part that you might notice. Uh, but it's just really basic stuff. Again, you mentioned setting the white balance and what have you. Um, and then I go through the, the entire focus stacking workflow. And once I have the image now flattened down as a, uh, as a singular piece, that's when I might uh, deal with cropping. You know, I don't know if my, it's kind of hard to say it's a horizon here, but I, I, I want to make sure that if, those if adjustments the image are done. Looks level, right. Exactly. And, uh, and some, some basic cleanup work of, of which there was so little in this one. Uh, I, was, I was quite thrilled with the way it all came together. This, by the way, um, is, uh, is one of my best-selling water droplet images, my best-selling images of all time, actually, uh, partly because of the way that it turns out. But also, Steve, that behind-the-scenes photograph that you were showing, when I'm at an art show uh, and I pull that up on my phone or I pull up a five by seven of that. And I say, by the way, I'll tuck this five by seven in the back of that frame. And you can take that home as a conversation piece with this, uh, with this artwork. Um, that seals the deal that makes the sale, uh, because then it becomes real. It becomes this, I didn't do a lot of post because this is physics combined with art to create something kind of magical here. And when people see that behind the scenes image and they realize that you get in at the right angle, this image kind of makes itself aside from focus stacking, that's where the real magic is. And the fact that I did little in post makes it all the more powerful down the road. So I have one last question for you. And that is you mentioned that in Lightroom, you might do shadow, bring up shadows or minor adjustments in Lightroom before you bring it into Photoshop for your focus stacking workflow. But you've got 100 images of which you're going to use 15. So you will modify one picture and then you simply sync it to the rest? Well, I, I copy and paste it. Sync is superfluous because I'm never going to go back. But what right? I'm saying is you're not editing each picture individually. You're making your edits on one and you're moving those edits to all the other frames that you took. Exactly. Okay. So again, I just think the shot, I think everybody, I know I've tried, like I say, and I failed. I think everybody's tried to do water droplet refractions and hopefully everybody will go try to do them again. And if you do tag us, I'd love to see what you come up with as you do this. And if you have questions, comment on the video on YouTube or hit me or Don up on social media. If you're watching it through the podcast feed, we respond. Don is 
crazy about responding to people on on the B episode. He responded to a lot of people that had questions or comments on it. So <laughs> yeah, Don, go check if, that out. Yeah, there's a lot of them up there. Go look. Trust me. So if people want to find more about Don Komarechka, again, your lower thirds have been coming up with all your stuff. But let's just run through everything really quick. Your two websites are what? Uh, doncom.ca and skycrystals.ca.ca because I'm Canadian. Um, and uh, if you click on snowflakes on the doncom.ca website, it'll, it'll bring you to the snowflake website. I figured that was important enough. I do that for five months out of the year to have its own website. And of course, the podcast at uh, photogeekweekly.com or plug that photogeekweekly into iTunes or wherever you go and you will hear my voice on a weekly basis. Steve occasionally is there too, uh, chiming in and opining on the geekery that we can dig up. But Steve, before we move on, before we start- Hold on, on. before you do that, before you do that, I also want to mention both Facebook and Instagram are Doncom Photo, Flickr, 500px, and Twitter are just Doncom. And his Doncom CA, you can get to his workshops from there. So what were you going to say? Okay. So one thing that you couldn't have predicted, so you couldn't have asked a question Uh on, um, is how did that uh, seed take on that shape? Was that just happenstance? Did I pick out the right seed with the right curve? Well, I tried that in one of my initial experiments. What happens with prairie smoke seeds, uh, and the same is true of a lot of other similar spiny seeds like this, when they get wet, they animate. They start to move. Their curl uncurls or recurls or bends in the opposite direction, uh, you know, not parallel to the focal plane or does something unpredictable. So uh, part of the, uh, the hours of experimentation here was clamping a seed, getting it wet, and seeing what it would do. Because half the time, it would have the perfect shape when it was dry. And then as soon as it got wet, it was the most ugliest, you know, straight flop or whatever that was completely useless. So the fact that this curve is as picturesque as you see it is luck. Luck of maybe 50 or 60 attempts with these seeds, trying and retrying and retrying. I would have and never retrying. even thought to ask that. And so that also adds uh, some level of impatience. As I mentioned, I do this handheld and I do it quickly because if I don't get this shot, It's 50 more attempts maybe before I get another curve that behaves properly for the composition. So uh, there is a lot of me juggling all of these variables, but the subject is also a wild card here. It's much easier if I was using uh, like a a grapevine tendril where I'm putting some droplets on very uh, architecturally and positioning them, and I've done that too. This one was an exercise in you know, playing bingo, winning the lottery, whatever you want to say, the element of luck was a big part of this. Uh, And when I saw that perfect curve, I knew it's now or never. And you just have to put blinders on focus, problem solve within seconds, figure it all out. And this is not the first time I've done this. This is after years of experimentation within this subject. So I know the problems, encountering them, fixing them within seconds, and carrying that on to the final shot. And there's no substitute for those years of that stepping stone approach of finding these problems, maybe taking an hour to solve it on a similar subject, and then understanding how you can do that faster and faster, and it becomes instinctual over time. So and that, that in so many ways is the description of photography, right? It's it's the art of compromise. It's the art of patience. It's not unsimilar to fishing in some ways. I mean, I know landscape photographers who will go back to the same location five times before everything lines up and you've got the clouds in the right spot and the right kind of clouds and the lighting right. And, oh, now this time there's a little bit of snow cap on the mountains. It's it's trial and error. And the patience is part of, it's part of the art to create it. Now, if you are a geeky photographer and you want to try macro photography or snowflake photography, make sure you check out all of Don's stuff online. You can always reach out to him. He's got his Sky Crystals book as well. And you can find out stuff everywhere and make sure you check out the Photo Geek Weekly podcast. It's at photogeekweekly.com. My buddy, thank you so much for joining me, Don. I appreciate it. And one more thing. I, I haven't announced it yet. And, uh, and it will be announced if people are watching this video and it's as timeless as that sweat bee, uh, video is people are still watching it now and engaging with it. I am going to be crowdfunding a macro photography book, uh, much like I did with sky crystals coming up this spring. 
and I'm writing the table of contents and figuring out the number of pages and, and putting together, I've got quotes from the printers. Um, Steve, if you could be so kind, once that campaign goes live to add that to the YouTube or to the show notes for this episode, once that becomes available, uh, that'll be in a few months from the time that this airs. But uh, look for it. If you want to learn how to do this ad nauseum, exhaustive details, every step of the process in written form, that will be one small section of this 300 plus page book that I'm currently uh, at the beginning. I will, yeah, let me know when it goes live. I'll I'll add a link in the show notes and put it in the comments on YouTube as well. And the people listening can look for that. So thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate yeah, just your time. The, the, again, the main thing is watch, follow Don on social media. His snowflake a day is worth it right there. Um, <laughs> but if you also, if you run by his website, you'll see obviously when this stuff gets announced. Don Komarechka, thank you so much for stopping by. My pleasure. Thank you, Steve. So there we go. There's another episode of Behind the Shot. You can find out uh, more about the show itself at BehindTheShot.tv. There will be a blog post associated with this episode also at BehindTheShot.tv with information about Don, a small gallery of Don's work, and all the links that we've talked about throughout the show to all of his work. I'll get the new book in there as well when that comes out. Again, thank you so much for stopping by Behind the Shot. If you would, leave us a review on iTunes when you get a shot. As usual, my name is Steve Brazel. If you want to follow me on social media, you can head to the websites, Steve Brazel. uh, Actually, I hit the wrong one up. I meant to hit this one up. There we go. SteveBrazzle.com or BehindTheShot.tv are the websites. Let's go back to the other one I just hit, which is Facebook. It's Steve Brazel Photography or Behind the Shot Podcast. And then, of course, on Instagram or Twitter, it's just Steve Brazel or Behind the Shot TV. You can find me anywhere. Comment on the video on YouTube. Hit me up on social media. And again, as always, thanks for stopping by. Have a great day, and we'll see you on the next show. Thank you.